Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stacy Robinson. <laughs> I'm a graphic designer, illustrator, graphic novelist, DJ, an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. All right. All right. Yes, hear you now. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm going to talk to you about two exhibitions, one here on campus, the other one um, in the downtown gallery, UT Downtown Gallery, Black, Black Utopias, Black Distractions and Disruptions in Time Space, and Audacious Black Freedom Dreams. And uh, Black Utopias is a solo exhibition of my own work and thought and philosophy, while Black, Audacious Black Freedom Dreams, which is only, what, two or three doors down from here in the art gallery, um, is a collaborative show with my one of my best friends, DJ partner, and collage artist, uh, Kamal Grantham. To contextualize my work a little bit, I am a comic artist. And I work digitally. I'm working on the iPad Pro primarily. I'm a graphic designer by trade. I lean into the digital because as a graphic designer and as a digital maker, I can get the work out really quickly. Any digital makers in here? Anybody drawing on the iPad Pro using Procreate or some other software? Absolutely. It's a game changer, right? Especially that time lapse video. Anybody using that? The time lapse video? Oh my goodness. Absolutely. All right, so these are three posters that I created um, using the iPad Pro. And uh, the power of BIPOC Pop is, um, it was a poster for a black and brown comic convention in Austin, Texas. Uh, this, earlier this year, I was commissioned to make this image. The second image is the, um, some, uh, some branding and some promotional material for CAMCON, which is the California African American Museum Comic Book Convention. And I created some, um, some branding for, for them as well, along with my partner, John Jennings. And the, set, the third image here is the promotional poster for I Am Alfonso Jones, which is considered the first Black Lives Matters inspired graphic novel. This is my process. So um, I, I'm, working, I'm working digitally. At this time, I was using Photoshop. I did not use the iPad Pro for this. But uh, this book was grayscale. And if I could change any, if one thing about the book, I would definitely have made this book in color. We literally did not have the time to make this book in, co in, in color. It would have had to print overseas and we would have missed the deadline. So we had to print it in black and white. But uh, this is some of the process of, of those pages. One of the other books that we created, uh, myself, along with John Jennings and our colleague Damian Duffy, is Kid Code Tracks to Freedom. Kid Code is a, is a book that we created back in 2014. I'm very late on the second and third issue. I don't do well with creating single issues of comics. I, am a gra I like a graphic novel. I like a complete story, and I could work my way through it and be done. Issue to issue, just that format just doesn't work with me. I have too many deadlines and responsibilities on campus um, and to my exhibition practice. This is a book about Kid Code and Roxy Clockwise, who are intergalactic time travelers seeking the, the broken pieces to God's voice. Um, and so once they find those pieces and they can assemble it, they can establish peace across the cosmos. And in this particular 15-page adventure, <coughs> Kid Code and Roxy Clockwise, excuse me, um, went across time and space to find Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to tell him how important his vision of the future um, would be to the future. And, and remember where he says in the speech, in one of his final speeches, he said, I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, right? But I've seen the promised land. And that was a beautiful statement to establish hope in us for the future. And Kid Code and Roxy, went to show him that vision of the future. And they brought him throughout um, across time and space to do that. Across the Tracks is the, the latest graphic novel I did, I created in 
2021 in the centennial year of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And anybody here ever, ever hear of the Tulsa Race Massacre? Okay, not enough of you. Look it up. It's one of the most horrific events in our Amer in American history. And I don't say black history. I say American history because it really is American history. It is not black history. We could debate that for sure. But when we think of it as American history, we realize that that history belongs to all of us. And we, it's all of our, our responsibility to share it. All right. These are three pages from the book. Um, in, in early 2021, no, pardon me, early, what is it, 2021? Early 2021, we worked on this book and uh, we made the deadline. We had a month and a half to get out a 50 page graphic novel in full color, including the script. The writer, Al Vern Ball, wrote this story while he had COVID. Cr incredible. And as soon as the editors approved the script, I started drawing. Um, it was a lot of late nights and early mornings and sitting at my desk and eating fast food. And it was not the best of times necessarily, but I will say creatively, I made some of the best work I'd ever made um, in my life sequentially. I hired my son and some former students to help me uh, finish the book. And it was really awesome to put some money in their pockets as well. This is my process. I told you I'm working on the iPad Pro. I'm using Procreate, but I work like a trish, like I'm, I'm working through a traditional aesthetic. I'm working in layers, even though I'm working um, digitally, I'm working like if I were actually drawing comic pages and pencil, because that's what I used to do. And so I use one layer to sketch out a really rough sketch. And I, the opacity on that is dropped down this black line but it's dropped down to about 25 to 30%. Then I do what are called full inks on another layer on top of that. And then in this process, I sent this page to my son who did what is called flat color. So like, you know, one person is one flat color. I diversified the skin tones and I balanced some of the uh, backgrounds and things like that to make things pop. And then I added um, highlights only on the foreground images just to make them pop a little bit from the background while also keeping a consistent aesthetic so that we can get this book out. That was important. All right, we're catching up to where we were before. All right, we are at Parliament Funkadelic. And some of you said you've, you've heard of Parliament Funkadelic. Album cover art is a major influence to my work. And the uh, uh, Motor Booty Affair album especially is a heavy, heavy influence. It's a gatefold album cover that folds out. And there's a pop-up in inside, which is the story of an underground city of Atlantis where all of these Black people live as amphibious humans. And um, I find that fascinating as a mythology. That actually is a mythology of, um, of Black people who jumped overboard uh, the slave ships and I like to say enslaved Africans. I don't like to call the black people who are enslaved slaves. So I will, if I refer to that moving forward, I will say enslaved Africans. But the enslaved Africans who jumped ship or who were thrown overboard, um, there's a mythology that they became these black mermaids. I believe the artist, the artist, his name is Maddie Abdul Clairween. I could be wrong about that. I need to check that and be sure. Um, Major influence to my work. How many of you uh, recognize the Miles Davis's Bitches Brew album cover? How many of you recognize Santana's Abraxas album cover, right? Major, major influences, and not just the visuals, but the records themselves, right? Major influences to my work. And then on the um, Parliament um, um, Funkadelic, um, Funkintelliki album, inside that, I have an original pressing of that that I inherited. And there's a comic on the inside. Awesome, awesome comic. Overton Lord is the um, um, illustrator on that comic. And it's a major influence to my work. I actually have the original pressing and the comic. And the Wu Massacre 2010 album cover is a major influence to my work as well. That dropped in 2010, and it features three members of the Wu-Tang Clan, their, their trio album. All right. So I had the very fortunate opportunity to work on 
a Grammy-nominated album with my, my high school classmate, really good friend, Stefan Harris. And around 2009, uh, we connected and his manager um, you know, organized this collaboration. And Stefan and I connected after many years and we we're like, he was like, yo, I really wanna work with you on this album cover. We're like, yo, I've always wanted to work with you on an album cover. So it really worked out and this album went on to be Grammy nominated. I'm super duper proud of that. And I really got to use a lot of grungy, fun aesthetics that I was playing with at that time. And it really kind of marked a period uh, where I was using grunge aesthetics. I work in a tradition and two of the traditions that I work in uh, that I use as tenets for helping me create work, like I, I said earlier, that I don't just make work with no philosophical or theoretical um, background or foundation to my work. So two influences out of the few that I really think about, the Black Panther Party 10 point program has three points that I really like to lean to and think about. We want freedom, we want power to determine the destiny of our black community, that's point one. Point seven, we want the immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people, that's point seven. And point 10, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. Now, these tenets should be for all of us. These are things that we would all want. These are humane. These are humane tenets. I use them to help me ground my work. The Political Artist Manifesto of Emory Douglas. Emory Douglas is the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party. There are two points that I really lean on um, in his, his manifesto that talks about what black art should do, of the political artist manifesto. Point six, art to create black art, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, we should be, our black artists should be creating art of social concerns that even a child can understand. And point nine, Black artists should create art that challenges the colonization of the imagination. And we're catching up to where I was before. And these points help to frame my work. Even if you don't understand all of the pop cultural references in my work, that is okay. I believe that there is enough in my work to jumpstart the imagination. And the decolonization of the Black imagination is really, really important to my work. So I asked you all a question, and this is for the listening audience as well. I said earlier that I argue that, first of all, I argue that Black people have never been free in this country or in colonial spaces. I also argue that most of the world is not free. But I asked you a question earlier, maybe you had some time to think about it. Where can Black people, or where are Black people free? Where can Black people be free? Did anybody think about that? Have time to think about that? All right. Anybody, anybody else agree with that? Anybody else going to say that? All right, I see some other hands up. My art, yes. OK, yep, you got it. So my, my belief is that Black people are free inside of our own decolonized black imagination. The decolonized part is important, not just our black imagination, but our decolonized black imagination, where we can imagine ourselves in the future. That's very important to Afrofuturism. I've been asking students all week, how many of you have ever thought about black people in the future? And I'll ask you all that too. How many of you have ever thought about black people in the future? It's always about five to 10% of the audience who's ever, ever thought about that. Now, here's the thing. This is not the point where I shame you and tell you how bad you are or whatever. Here's the thing. There's a reason why we don't think about black people in the future. Science fiction used to not show us in the future. If you grew up on Star Wars, I mean, grew up on the original Star Wars series. Yeah, yeah, more hands. How many of you grew up on the original Star Trek series? Right? All right, and, and who, in Star Wars, who was the, the black character? Lando Calrissian, Billy D. Williams, 
coolest black man in space for sure. Absolutely right. Now, if you're gonna be the only black man in space, be Billy D. Williams for sure. All right, I'm not mad at that. And I am mad at that, but I'm like, eh, it's Billy D. Williams, right? But here's the thing, on Star Trek, who is the black character? Lieutenant Uhura, right? Nyota uh, Uhura, right? So in main times, we, we saw the back of her head because she's always out of council, on the council, right? Until she says something, she spins around in a chair, right? She's a communications officer, which is a very, very important you know, position, right? She's the one who understands thousands of languages and, and can interpret, right? And her, without her, the enterprise actually doesn't function. Right, you have your hand up. I will get questions later. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Who knows the reading rainbow guy? LeVar Burton, baby. Come on. All right, LeVar. Shout out to LeVar Burton. And let me tell you, oh, treat yourself. I'm gonna give you a little bit of homework. He has a podcast on Spotify. You checked it out, right? Oh my goodness. I'm gonna give y'all some homework. Y'all do some digging. I'm not even gonna tell you the name of it, but many, many short stories. And it's like reading Rainbow for adults. Yes, it's like, it's my addiction. Oh, I listen to it with my students. Anyway, 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 right? So these tenets, right? Absolutely right. This is important, right? Even with that, there's still too few black people in the future. So for me, I'm looking at and thinking about what happens from now into the future where black people disappear and we're not in the future. The reason why I started asking those questions is because science fiction becomes science fact very easily. Seriously, how many of you have a smartphone in your pocket right now? If you don't have it, how many of it is close by, <laughs> right, right? Where did this idea for this come from? Shout it out, y'all know it. Star Trek, this was the tricorder, right? Science fiction became science fact. How many of you have big screen televisions at home? Most of us do, right? The Star Trek technology, that came from Star Trek as well. The Star Trek technology, we've already beaten that in time. We're before the Star Trek time now and that technology, we have that technology right here and right now. And guess what we're doing right now? We're literally replicating food, making fake food, right? Synthetic food, kind of like on Star Trek. AI is already with us, right? This, this is here, right? So here's the thing. I think about where, what happened to us that we are not in the future. Then I started looking at current trends in popular culture or in, in our culture, police brutality, food deserts, lack of access to fresh water, poverty and other conditions that allow for black people to cannibalize each other, lack of education, redlining, and many, many other things lead to the extinction of us in the future. But I, I believe that, and I believe that this is traumatic on our thinking. This is why we don't think about black people in the future. We're not seen. And when you don't see somebody, you automatically, if you don't see that representation, it, it's a form of erasure. I believe that the healing from black trauma or the healing of colonial trauma is an algorithm because I believe that there was a system that created the trauma. So let me show you how I think about this. And I'm, I'm, I'm a designer and I, I think about design systems. I'm, talk, I'm talking to some design students, graphic design students earlier. I study systems and what makes a system work and what makes a system fail, right? Systems design, everybody think about and study systems design. Do some little bit of research about systems design. White supremacy is a philosophy. It's a philosophy. Yet, it is founded, grounded, and enacted 
and a system called racism. Does that make sense? The danger is the philosophy that is backed by the system. I believe because of that, black healing from colonial trauma is an algorithm that has to be built out into a system. That makes sense? So what does that look like? I have this, this screen up here. I'm not expecting you to look at all of these details, but I created a system um, that is in the form of what I call a cosmosgram. And I based that on the idea of the cosmogram. And in my cosmosgram, I, I'm working with several systems that I look at and think about that um, can be that one, help me organize my thoughts and my work, but also can get me to think about what systems of resistance can be used to correct um, colonial trauma. So I'm looking at uh, the systems from the 5% Nations of Gods and Earths, a system called the 12 Jewels, which begins with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and ends in love, peace, and happiness. I'm looking at the seven principles of Kwanzaa, the, the Nguza Saba. And I'm also looking at the, the five primary elements of hip hop. But this is based on, once again, I'm looking, I'm not just looking at um, systems. I'm also, once again, I'm building on the shoulders of ancestral knowledge. And so one of the things I started looking at was the Bukongo cosmogram of the Congo people of West Africa who have a counterclockwise system of looking at um, life. And I built this out to look at and think about how time travel for many people, for many uh, Black people, we don't look at time as linear but we look at time as more, um, more circular. For me, I look at time travel as more spherical and more three-dimensional and more fourth-dimensional. And this is what that looks like. But this also, I'm looking at a system, the hero's journey. How many of you know the hero's journey? Yeah, more of us know the hero's journey. That's awesome. Um, for those of you who don't know it, look at the hero's journey and look at that and, and think about your favorite stories and how many of these mimic like our favorite stories. The story of Star Wars, for example, even the, the story of Moses, right, is, is mimics, like, is, is, is a template of the hero's journey. Many, many stories. So I look at this clock and I look at this and I'm thinking about how this connects to my work. All right. These are images from the downtown exhibition. I, I please, please, Friday night, well, if you can go tomorrow or before Friday, check out the exhibition. Uh, please check it out come Friday. I'm gonna say from six, starting at six o'clock, the first five, the first five, no, the first 50 people to come will get a free um, James Baldwin print that I will sign. You gotta be one of the first 50 people and you can't come at like 5.59, you gotta come like at six o'clock. Um, and that is to make it, here's, huh? 5.59 at six o'clock. <laughs> All right, 5.59, 550, you can come at 5.59 at 5.59.59. All right, um, here's the thing. Um, I want, I want to bless everyone who can come and we wanted to make this at six o'clock because everybody, you know, people get off at five. Sometimes they got to go home, take care of their families and do things, but they might be able to make it there by six o'clock. So we wanted to make it more equitable. I'll be there signing prints. Um, and I want to have a conversation, right? So as was mentioned earlier, these are black and white images with tones of gray that help it to pop off of the wall. I love black and white. I love ink and I love using the white of the gallery wall. There's a commentary that I have where many times where I paint on a gallery wall, either myself, I've had to do this by the end of the exhibition or somebody, they always have to return that wall color to a pristine white. So no matter how black my commentary was, no matter how much that Afrofuturist discussion brought all of our communities together, that conversation always has to be taken out of there and those walls have to be returned to white. And there's a powerful commentary there 
about how we think about whiteness and space and those types of things. So I wanted to use that to create black and white work that popped out of the wall in a very unique way. Black, and that, that show is Black Utopias, uh, Destruct, Black Distractions and Disruptions in Time Space. And I'm gonna read this quote from Toni Morrison. The function and very serious, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Back in 2017, I believe it was, um, President Donald Trump said, why, something along the lines of, why are we bringing in all these people from countries like Africa and Haiti? We ought to be immigrating people from Norway. You remember him saying that, right? I see some head nods. I'm not making this stuff up, y'all, right? And that is connected to how we think about making America great again and what that means, right? Countries like Africa, right? I mean, we could stop there and have a whole conversation around that, right? But guess what happened after that? Many writers, reporters, journalists, and people responding spent a lot of time talking about that. It was a distraction. Racism, I paraphrase this, I, I, I used this quote because I had my own and then I discovered this one. Racism and white supremacy are distractions from us planning and executing our black liberated futures. We've spent too much time responding to what people say and do instead of, and we're supposed to, that's exact. Somebody says your head is big, somebody say you stink, somebody you know, calls you a, a, the N word or whatever, you start cussing them out and arguing and, and it's a distraction, it keeps you off focus. So these are images, I showed you three of them earlier. These are some more images. I created 10 logos, y'all. Um, this is a collection. First of all, this show is a, is, a series of prototypes, 10 logos, uh, 10 images from the Supreme, Supreme Mathematics, which is also a system uh, from the 5% Nations of Gods and Earths, and then 10 images of people who I consider to be you know, thinkers that lead us into the future, or Afrofuturist thinkers for short. And the logos are inspired by Jim Crow advertising and signs. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about that. If you come to the gallery on Friday, I'll spend a lot more time talking about that. These are some more images uh, from those three series. And I think that as a graphic designer, I, I remixed Jim Crow signage. So how many of you have ever seen Jim Crow advertising? How many of you have seen um, the Tar Baby soap um, advertisement. How many of you have ever heard of Gator Bait? A few of you, right? So Gator Bait is, there's an idea or a belief, and there are toys and images made of this. People question whether it's true or not, but here's the thing, the artifacts have been made that enslaved black people's children, their babies would be stolen and used as bait to catch alligators. I remixed that in the show um, downtown, and we'll talk more so about that. How many of you know who Rock Him Ala is? Ooh. Come on now, yeah, the hip hop heads. Come on, this is the golden era of hip hop. All right, so really, real, real dope shout out, uh, peace to Rock Him. We are working on a project and we got to go back. I got to talk to him about that project and see when we're working on that. But um, really good friend of mine, Bakari Kitwana um, and Rakim co-wrote his autobiography, uh, Don't Sweat the Technique. And it is a super dope book. It's a really, really awesome book. I met him when I was at Harvard and I had drawn a picture of him. I did a, a portrait because I consider him an Afrofuturist thinker. And I showed him and he signed it. Like he signed my iPad, it's crazy. Like he signed the piece. That's actually Rakim's like signature in the piece at the top here. 
And um, and it's funny, like during this meeting, my mom called and I was like, Ma, I can't talk to you right now. I'm talking to Rock Kim right quick. She's like, oh, put him on the phone. <laughs> right? I'm like, Ma, right. I want to talk to Rock Kim. Literally, Rock Kim took the phone, got into his vehicle, and sat there talking to my mama. And I'm like, what, what are they talking about? Why is Rock Kim talking to my mama, right? Now, it's funny, I brought this up to my mom. I'm like, Mom, when I first introduced you to Rock Kim, we were listening to his first album as we were walking. And it was that lyric where he says, um, um, thought I was a donut, she tried to glaze me, right? I, I was like 14 when I heard that. I didn't get it, right? And my mom's like, ah, that's disgusting, nah, nah, nah. I reminded, now she's like, oh, I like Rakim. Rakim don't cuss in his songs. He's so nice, da da da. I'm like, mom, you didn't like Rakim before, right? <laughs> so uh, this is a piece, and I, this is a cherished moment. I really appreciate this. All right, I have this piece here. Um, sorry, some of these are pixelated. I didn't realize they would be. Sorry about that. I hope you can see them clear enough. Um, like I said, I'm working in the seven principles of Kwanzaa as well. And this piece is called Kwanzaa is a Blood River Future. This was a piece, um, this piece, and if you go to my website, you'll see it in the DJ section. So go to my website, stacyarobinson.com. Go to the DJ section. You'll see an animation of this with a DJ mix that I did. This was a prompt originally for a virtual um, session in the Sundance Film Festival. And I was sitting there with a number of people illustrating prompts, one of the best prompts I'd ever heard as an artist. And the prompt was, listen to this, y'all. The prompt was, if you as an artist, all of your financial needs were met and you had no need of money, you had all the money you ever needed, what type of work would you create as an artist? I had never heard of such a thing. How many of you as artists, that's the dream, right? That's like every artist would want that money. All the money I want is not an issue. What type of work would we make as artists? As we talked through this exercise, I thought about this. And I was like, and I got sad, I'll be honest. I realized that just because I have all the money I need ever as an artist, don't mean the community around me have all of their needs met. Shayla, I see you. I see you, right? You're, you're nodding your head, right? They, their needs are not met. I see you nodding your head too, right? The community does not have all of their needs met. So I might have more, more money to address certain concerns, but guess what? I want to end that system of inequity. So my artwork would not change. Money is not the reason why I make this work. But it was an amazing prompt to help us think through it. So I looked at, I, and I had a discussion with them. And I was like, well, let's look at and think about systems of justice or that can be used as systems of justice. And so I drew this image of, of, that represents Kwanzaa. And it's the seven principles of Kwanzaa that found each other, building up upon each other, but they're moving through into the future as a wave. But I call it a blood river because equity will cost everyone in blood. People will have to die to create equity because that's what happens in our culture. It's not pretty, but it's true. Whenever we try to change the system of capitalism, it it always it's always by violence. It always results in some form of violence. To get to the equitable future, and it doesn't have to be. I do not believe it has to be, but it does, or at least you know traditionally. All right, Audacious Black Freedom Dreams, the exhibition that you was, you'll see in the gallery. We're all going to the gallery later. I'll talk to you about the work. Let's have some fun later. Um, this exhibition is inspired by two books. We want to do More Than Survive, which is by a really good friend, Bettina L. Love. Amazing, amazing book. Read that book and then read the new book that just dropped about a month ago, Punished for Dreaming. Amazing, amazing books. And Robin D.G. Kelly's book, Freedom Dreams. I have two quotes, a quote from each of those books um, that give some context to the exhibition. The work that you will see in the gallery is created by myself and Kamal Grantham, my really good friend who's a psychologist and DJ on campus. Kamal and I have, we have so many odd overlaps. We're like, yo, we need to do something with this. We lived in four of the same places. 
he was born and raised in Buffalo, New York, where I later went to grad school. He went to grad school in Albany, New York, where I was born and raised. He lived in, we both lived in New York City, City for a period of time. And now we both live in Champaign, Illinois. Actually, he lives in Urbana. I live in Champaign. They're two majoring cities, right? Super duper close. You can walk from one to the other, right? Um, we, and then we both think about Afrofuturism, Afrocentrism through house music and jazz and really obscure music in some very similar ways. He was already DJing and a collage artist. I was a collage artist and emerging DJ. We had so many th similar overlaps. We're like, we should make artwork together and see what that looks like. So we started doing it. This first piece was our first collaboration together. It's called Guilt Trip. And um, we've been working together since 2019. And we're working on our fourth body of work, uh, our next show will be will open on November 1st in Champaign. And uh, Kamal is one of my best friends. And we, our process, I like to talk about our process. So many times we, our collaboration is, he will start a piece and hand it off to me. I will start a piece and hand it off to him. Sometimes he makes the entire piece. Sometimes I make the entire piece. And we use a method and we think about it how many of you know who the band, the Tribe Called Quest is? I say the band, but the rap group was, all oh, right, more hands went up, a Tribe, a tribe Called Quest, right? Sometimes um, Fife would do a song. Sometimes Q-Tip would do a song. Most times they did a song together, right? And we kind of used that method even jokingly, like, well, we're a Tribe Called Quest. We're going to use that method, right? Um, and so that's our method. We're digital collage artists. We're using the digital medium. Uh, because it's it's more expedient. Actually, we, we do traditional collage, or we used to, but it's more expedient to do the digital, especially with our um, with our our schedules being what they are. We collage high and low resolution images together on purpose. We add these layers of grunge to make the work look really aged, like it was a poster that was hanging in a New York City subway that was weather damaged. And we really try to copy those, some of those aesthetics. But these pieces are very surreal. So there are these spaces that exist outside of time and space. Because, like I said, I believe that Black people cannot be free inside of a colonial space. And when Black spaces are made physical, like, like the, the, the town of Greenwood, many times those, those cities, those Black spaces of affluence are destroyed because of their affluence and their self-sustainability. So we create work that exists outside of time and space. As or as Sun Ra would say, anybody know who Sun Ra is, the jazz musician? He says in his movie, uh, Space is the Place, 1974, I believe, where he says, um, the first thing we must do is to consider time as officially ended. We'll work on the other side of time. But we love collaborating too. Kamau and I love to collaborate. And we connected with a uh, really good friend, Chris Kinson, and uh, Manuela, I forgot Manuela's last name, and then Joe Blanks um, as well. And we are a new group. Literally, we are so new that our name is like a week old. <laughs> we were bouncing back and forth in the thread coming up with names and nobody liked the name. And uh, like three weeks ago or so, I was listening to a, a song by Curtis Mayfield, We the People Who Are Darker Than Blue. And I proposed that as a name, Darker Than Blue. And then why as well? Everybody was like, oh yeah, I like that, I like that, I like that, I like that. Um, and so we're a new DJ um, quintet, spinning really different and obscure music. We all spin very differently. And we're literally figuring out what our collaboration is as we create spaces of peace. We, um, we have what is called Create and Chill, where we would get together at this place called the Independent Media Center once a month. And we might bring one record each. We might bring a crate of records. And we will spin like, and create this ambiance and create this environment for other people to come and create in 
for other people to come and meet in. This came out of the cafe where we were doing this in the cafe for fun, just getting together as homies. And it got so good. We're like, yo, we need to do this for everybody. And we started doing it. And people are like, oh, when are you going to do that Create and Chill again? When's the next Create and Chill? So it, it became a, a thing that we were doing for us that we got to share with the entire community. And it's beautiful to see the other collaborations that other people were able to create because they were in a space that we created for them. These are some other samples of our work. I'm not going to necessarily talk about these images. I want to get through this so we can get through the Q&A. But these are, much of our work is really open to interpretation. And Kamau is much better at the improvisation of collage than I am. I'm pretty, I tend to be pretty tight and I got to think about, maybe it's the grad school influencing me. Why are you making the work? And why, what are you thinking about this? And I'm like, oh, I, I, sometimes I'm sticking to the, um, the confines too much. And come out will be like, I don't know, it just felt right and I did it, <laughs> you know? And then he'll give it to me and I'm like, well, what do I want to keep and what do I want to alter? And I try to find a really good balance of doing both. This is a piece that we're going to exhibit um, in a few weeks. This is one of the, we're, we're making 10 pieces this year. And this is one piece that we've not shown yet. So we're going to add this to the collection, Feedback Loop. The another one I'll show you in a moment. We started using royalty-free images. It got to a point where I felt guilty kind of using images that were somebody else's. Um, I used to on purpose use Associated Press images. I stole those images because I rem there was a time where they were documenting the Black Lives Matters movement. And in order to use those photos, you had to pay for them. So for me, I was like, well, am I buying the, the Black Lives Matter movement? Am I blind buying freedom? Am I buying Black protest in order to talk about it? How do they own it? I'm not saying they don't have the right to sell those images, but I was questioning some things. My Life, AKA Black Starline, is another image that we're gonna be showing. This marks kind of a new direction. This one, a feedback loop. Uh, that is a lot, uh, that really is a good mashup, I think, of our collage styles. His is a lot more traditional, even though we're working digitally. And mine, I really like to do things like use the opacities and the blends uh, that are available in Photoshop to create some, um, like, like with the faces you see, like these two faces are becoming one face and they're two different genders. And like, it just really speaks to black men, black women, we get to the future together. And too many times in, in um, black intellectual thought, there is a critique of, one, a critique of men many times, and this idea that black men and black women are going to be in the future by themselves without us. And I, I don't, I just can't co-sign that. We all need to get to the, the future together. We, just, we got to. This is one of our most popular pieces, Unadjusted Now Raw. We dropped this right before the COVID era. So when the COVID era came, the quarantine came, and a lot, we were watching a lot of protests and there were a lot of uh, tear gas and, and um, you know, and gas masks, you know, evident in the culture. This became a very popular piece. We actually did it before that, but it's because we always feel like, like we're at the very moment of, of protest all the time. So we made a piece that looked at it and thought about that. And just a few months later, we were in that moment. This piece right here, um, this is a series within our series, this, uh, this piece, Living in the City too. Rem uh, how many of you know of the four uh, black girls that died in a church bombing? Yeah, we know that story, right? This imagines them on the other side of time, but it's only three of them. One of them got lost in time space, so they're going throughout time and space to find the fourth. For, we call them the aunties, because <laughs> in black culture, like we, we, you know, we've been talking about aunties don't get enough love, 
And for me, I know my auntie was like my, my, like my second mama, <laughs> you know? So these, these three aunties are looking for they, their sister across time and space, but we follow them as they see these you know, um, like super surreal images as they pause to look at what is happening on their adventure. These pieces, like I said, are very open to interpretation. Orange Crush, the piece that you see there on the left is one of my favorites in this new body of work, um, Audacious Black Freedom Dreams. And I think I hit something right with this piece. Someone, one of the biggest compliments somebody ever gave me was, this piece is so sensual, I smell the orange slices. And I was like, this is what I'm trying to get to in my work. I'm trying to tap into those sensory aesthetics. How do you look at something and you smell what that smells like? How do you look at my artwork and you can hear what it sounds like? And I'm playing with that. So my wife and I on Monday, for example, um, in the evening, we closed out that evening with a meditation in the gallery in the circumference of the images. The gallery can be so much more and for me, the potential of the gallery as a healing space within Afrofuturism, within that commentary, is one of my biggest dreams. I'm studying how sound influences the body. And I believe, I truly believe, one of my goals is that if someone were to walk into the gallery, let's say that person had cancer, the sounds, the meditation, the energy of the space, the aesthetics of the space would heal them while they're in that space. And they would leave that gallery space because of all of that, they would leave the gallery space free of cancer. To me that, you know, yeah, that might sound really cheesy, but I believe it's possible because it's science. We can heal cancer with science. And I believe we can heal that through art and through sound and through the sensory and the extra sensory aesthetics. But with all of that I just said, I also still think about, do I have the right to heal somebody of cancer because they've walked into my space as well? So I'm looking at this through science um, and I'm, I'm, am I figuring out some things? I don't know, but I'm doing a lot of study and I'm talking to a lot of people who are thinking along some of these same lines as well and providing me with some really good research. I'm gonna show these four images and we're about to close out in a moment. I just think these four images look very beautiful together, very opulent. Um, and I just wanted to show these. I'm not going to talk about them. In the Sunshine is another very popular piece of ours. Um, we created this in 20, this is one of our original ones created in 2019 as well. And it depicts, once again, I think about where black kids can be safe at. There was a time very recently, um, and we know, we've heard these stories, right, about the police being called on, on black people or, you know, many times black kids for doing the most mundane things like swimming, like having a barbecue, like having fun. Right. And I was like, where are black kids at? Even black kids. Right. And there's a story of black kids swimming in the pool and the owner of that facility or supervisor, or whatever, came and was pouring acid in the pool. Y'all, y'all know that story. You have you seen those images. Right. Where are black people safe at? So I created an image where black people, where black kids are swimming on the surface of the sun. And I created a piece. This piece called In the Sun, well, Kamau and I created this piece called In the Sunshine. And there's a poem that I, I wrote uh, for it. Imagine black children swimming in the golden infinity of uninterrupted time outside of all that is you. Imagine their sun-kissed solar flare drip black, blackness of these children swimming in the center of our closest star. Imagine the black molten sunspots on every hue of black skin. If you see them, would you embrace them? Or would you call the police on them for having too much black starred fun? 
can your overabundance of bullets reach as far as the sun? Or would you seal your own fate as you stand there hating, gazing through white stared guns? Can you see through your own glare our shine as bright as what we swim in? Can you see through the purpose, can you see through purposely blinded eyes the joy we partake in as we mind in our own damn business? Will you burn out your own eyes, fantasizing in fear what you can't take your eyes off of? We are the origin, the definition, and the eclipse of all your enlightenment. We of sun darkened hue. We are the most beautiful, unimaginable, feared while fearful, black joy unspoken of, existing outside your own understanding of all that is you. That is called In the Sunshine. I was created to accompany this piece just as a contextualization. And I'm going to say to us all, Asante Sana, which means thank you very much in Swahili. Thank you very much.